All right, morning everyone. We might we might uh, kick off for the for the morning. Uh, welcome to our I think twenty third IAB weekly webinar. Um, this one's going to be a fun one. We're talking creative, um, and we've got a brilliant lineup um, for you. Um, so any of you who haven't joined our weekly webinars before, um, so we'll run for an hour. Um, you're welcome to pop questions into the Q and A box. We'll we'll get to them at the end. Um, feel free to chat in the chat box. Um, feel free to give feedback, um, claps, whatever you like to do. So love to love to keep it a bit interactive. So um, let's get off. And I've got a I've got a small role today, um, so it's an easy one for me. So we're going to share the hosting today between IAB hosts. So I'm going to kick off, give a little bit of background on on why we're talking about creative, if that's if that's not obvious for everyone. Um, and then I'm going to the end of the session is going to be uh, managed by our wonderful head of marketing and membership, probably the most creative person in our team, Jen Thomas, uh, is going to guide you at the end of the session. But we've got a great lineup of experts to um, talk to you today. Um, the way we're going to run today, we're going to have everyone give a small presentation um, and then we're going to come back for a panel. So kicking off with, with Sam Waters from Cantar, then we'll go to Blake Mosley from Hogarth, Gemma Lightfoot from Ipsos, uh, Maria Rando from Elastic, and then Maria will also be joined by Kate from Blackmores. So, um, and then we'll come back for a and a So get your questions um, going and We'll, um, we'll, we'll get through some interesting stuff. So the IBs, you probably used to us talking a lot about the media, the media planning, the technology side of things, um, and at times about creative, but we're spending a lot more time looking at creative um, and the impact and how we can manage it. Um, some of my early, early sort of work, my background is as a researcher, a, and an analyst uh, was trying to tell creatives um, from research on, on how to, I guess, optimise, improve, change their creative, which usually didn't go that well. Creatives don't like to be told, but I think we've evolved, I guess, in the last 20 years or so as an industry to, you know, really marry that understanding of um, impact, effectiveness, and, and making sure that creative works really well. So I guess we'll hear from everyone today if that, if that marriage of sort of art and science is really, is really happening to give great, um, great creative and market. Um, proof points. So a couple of proof points from different, different analysts, which slightly different numbers as you always get, but both prove the same point. Uh, we put out some research with analytic partners a couple of years ago um, at our, one of our Measure Up conferences and looking at the impact and the importance of creative on a campaign or on oppression. Um, you can see the numbers there in terms of creative being the, the most important part of, um, of, a, camp of a piece of uh, inventory actually working or not. So you can see, particularly for TV and online video, working quite similarly, even more important, I guess, from an in online video point of view to cut through. Um, display, coming coming a little bit slighter there, but um, slightly more cost effective is the way I word online display. So for, um, some of those other factors coming through a bit more strongly there, but it's really the biggest lever um, that you can use. So this is, this is from Kanta. Uh, from a report that we put out uh, with Kantar a couple of years ago, and they use this in a lot of their research. So half the impact of um, the driver of effectiveness is going towards creative quality. So, you know, if if you're doing one thing in terms of improvement, um, creative is the, um, and I'd like to say easy shortcut, but I'm sure it's not easy. And these guys today will tell us if it's easy or not. Um, but the number one factor that can can improve performance for um, for an ad campaign. So I think it's appropriate finishing on a Kantar slide to hand over to a, a Kantar presentation. So Sam, if, if you want to take over uh, and take us through what you've got. Thank you, yeah, let me just change screens. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Gay. Um, let me just change my arrangement. So I guess the, the first thing, first things first when attempting to answer 
the question of how we deliver great creative. I really want to emphasize that there is, of course, absolutely no magic formula um, to deliver extraordinary creative. Um, great campaigns, of course, require great talent and effort um, from creative professionals. However, saying that, the best practice rules that, that we use and the, the practice rules that guide that journey to effective ads need not actually be that difficult. And I'm going to take the next few minutes um, giving you a brief overview of those guidelines that, that we typically look at when evaluating advertising and share a few examples of the best digital ads that we've seen over the past year. Before we move on to those guidelines, though, I did just want to share a recent stat from our COVID-19 barometer that we've been running on a monthly basis since, since March, asking a range of attitudes of consumers during the crisis. And of course, it pretty comes as absolutely no surprise to any of you that we have seen a significant uptick in the use of social media platforms and online media since the start of the year, no surprise. But it does just emphasize and continues to show that trend for digital just to get bigger and bigger as a channel. Um, and the rewards for getting creative right um, in this environment absolutely are huge. So back to the guidelines itself. And whilst there's lots of intricacies within um, the, the guidelines, that I could talk about each one for hours. The good news is that actually we can boil it down to just three main buckets. Um, the first one is about driving brand engagement. So that's all really about making sure your ad is enjoyable um, and highly engaging, i.e. something that's really gonna stand out and make it distinctive. And of course, crucially, it has to be linked to the brand as well. Equally, in a digital environment, these things need to happen almost immediately so that we can avoid that, that dreaded skip with digital advertising. The second one is about conveying, conveying meaningfully different associations. So this is really about making sure that your ad delivers its intended message. And that really is a message that you already know um, should, um, and from prior research, should deliver to your strategy and has potential to drive meaning and difference for your brand. And then the third one is creating short and long-term predisposition. So put simply, is the ad gonna drive a short-term persuasion or is it gonna drive a longer-term equity? So these, you might be looking at these and going, these, these seem quite simple. It's obvious things that you might want from advertising, but that's exactly what we want. And too often, I think we actually overcomplicate advertising. And if you look at the, the questions there at the bottom, um, that's surely what we really want from all of our ads and what is going to deliver great creative. So simplifying it, but in fact, I reckon we can, we can do even more. The reality is that if you deliver on one and two, three is always going to be a consequence of delivering those top two. So get one and two right, and you're probably 90% of the way there. So I guess let's see how those principles manifest in great creative in the real world. And I'm lucky to have on hand um, the absolute best of the best from 2019. So our Creative effect Effectiveness Awards um, brought in the results from ad testing across the globe in 2019 and examined which had the highest potential for not only generating saliency for the brand and driving short-term sales, but also driving long-term equity as well. So of course, I'm not gonna have the chance to share the full top 10 here. Um, there is a link that we'll share with you and you can see on screen if you did want to investigate further, which I would recommend. Um, but of course, I will share two examples here from the top five that role model those guidelines that I've just talked about, while also demonstrating a couple of extra observations that cropped up across the winners. I think that's key. The guidelines are obviously fairly simple, but there's, a, there's many ways that we can actually deliver them. It's quite a diverse way that it can be delivered. So the first ad I'm going to share absolutely delivers on branded engagement, but also touches on an observation that was present across many of those winners. And quite simply, that is about delivering a positive and uplifting tonality. There really is a lot to be said um, for raising a smile, and many of those top performers use humour to effectively create emotional engagement. Before I show the ad, interestingly, this is actually in contrast to what we've seen more broadly in that humour is, de is actually decreasing in advertising. So the only chart I'm going to show is this one. Um, you can see from the chart, so this is essentially, we've coded ads in our database that are, be that are being viewed as funny or lighthearted uh, versus those that aren't. And you can actually see that at the start of um, the millennium, we saw about half of ads having a level of humour. And that's really dropped off over the past two decades. 
So in fact, only about a third of ads now, now show humor. Um, it's been a long-term trend, but probably around the GFC, we kind of lost humor in advertising a little bit um, and it needs to come back. Which brings us on to our first ad. And this is Google's search the lyrics. It actually came from Indonesia. Lyric thinking out loud. We'll be loving you till we're 70. Tahu musik lebih gampang dengan Google. And baby my heart. So this is an ad that engages, grabs attention, and seamlessly actually integrates what's essentially a product demonstration into the narrative. So there's a great deal to be said for raising a smile, which in turn raises people's spirits, attention, and friend predisposition. The other observation I wanted to touch on was ad length. We know that Shorty Creative stands a better chance of actually being viewed within the digital context. Many of those top performers are well under 15 seconds. I think many advertisers and brands still have concerns that messages will be lost in such a short time, time span. Amstel's wine, Amstel 66, is a great example of how the message can be amplified by making the focal point of a joke, all delivered in under 10 seconds. Why do you think they call it Amstel 66? I'll because tell it has 66 calories, obviously. <laughs> Dutch guy stole my line. So this is a creative that is funny, obviously, but it shows that short ads can be creative, effective, and that short duration uh, doesn't have to mean short-term messaging um, or strategy. Why do you... So going back to what I said at the start and what we saw across those winners, one of the main takeouts when reviewing them all was certainly that it isn't a case of one size fits all. Now, there are a number of creative tactics together with these guidelines that can deliver a lasting impression in an effective way and help deliver cracking creative. And it would probably be remiss of me not to mention as a final point, uh, the IAB and Kantar's digital brand effect uh, report that was released last year that provides a deep analysis looking into the contribution of digital advertising and how it builds um, brands for long-term impact. So again, we'll provide that link uh, to you if you wanted to delve further. So thank you very much. I'll be handing over to Blake now. Hello, everyone. Uh, give me one second. Thank you, Sam. Just going to start to share my screen. Just give me one moment. Make sure that it's doing it with the sounds. Awesome. Hi everyone. Um, as Gay mentioned at the beginning of today's webinar, my name is Blake Mosley and I am the Digital Strategy Director at Hogarth. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Hogarth, we are a content production agency, part of WPP, where I head up all things data-driven, DCO and addressable. So think about any kind of piece of content or creative uh, that's personalized by audience, platform or channel. And to really kind of kick off today, um, I want to show a highlight or a video highlighting the needs uh, of today's consumer in terms of content. Are you ready? You've got eight seconds. Eight seconds to grab my attention. So if you blink, I'm gone. Already on to the next big thing. Oops. That was my fault, sorry guys. Are you ready? You've got eight seconds. Eight seconds to grab my attention. So if you blink, I'm gone. Already on to the next big thing. The next coolest app, the next streaming platform. Way before you've even heard of it. And by the time you have, I'll be on to something else. I've got the whole world at my feet. The internet of things in my hands. I can travel to far flung places. Journey through history. Do anything I want. In an instant, a heartbeat. On my phone, on my console, or on my TV. There's so much. So you have to grab me, grip me, entertain me, mean something to me. Don't try and stereotype or pigeonhole me. If you want to talk to me, talk to me. Don't waste my time or I'll be gone. 
You've got eight seconds. Let's go. So you can tell uh, I work for a content production business when we have very dramatic music to, to start a presentation. Uh, what's, uh, what's quite crazy uh, in this video, uh, it was only created at the beginning of the year. Um, so for a landscape that hadn't yet been impacted by COVID, fast forwarding to now, really reflecting on the year that it's been, already, as you probably can all tell, has changed, especially in our industry. So COVID really well and truly has reshaped what creative production means today. Um, it has influenced how we conceptualize an idea, how we build this idea, and really how do we automate this idea to help ensure uh, future agility and success for brands and marketers. So when COVID really hit our shores, it really threw a lot of brands into turmoil. Um, this is to really put it lightly, what we saw is a huge dip, but obviously taking into consideration the new market conditions and climate, uh, content quickly started to lose its relevance. Um, there was outdated messaging, offers and visuals, uh, and no longer was a piece of TVC, TVC content depicting people enjoying a summer vacation on a crowded beach in Europe, or even an office worker at his desk on a computer surrounded by coworkers sitting, at, uh, sitting there working really late at night with a pounding headache, only to lean in for that, re, uh, for that pain medication. That was no longer relevant, and that was still being shown on, on TV. So what that actually caused is, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the creative didn't work, meaning a lot of marketers had to remove their creative from market. And it left a huge content gap for them where they actually didn't have anything in market at all. So, I mean, even if brands wanted to change, uh, change their existing creative or produce a new piece of content, the luxury of a usual planning cycle was not an option, right? You can see in this, it usually takes about six months from ideation to actually production to get a piece of content to market. Um, but even if it was an option for brands, the issue that they still face is how do they plan uh, for what tomorrow might bring because it changes so quickly at this high, highly volatile time. Um, so let's take a little bit deep, uh, let's look a little bit deeper, sorry, into how COVID has impacted brands from a creative point of view, uh, really trying to understand how such a content gap was created. So in the first 90 days, what was really surprising to me is that e-commerce saw an incredible amount of growth, the same amount that usually accumulated across 10 years. Um, and as much as they may now have opened up new opportunities and streams of revenue for brands, it also left so many brands with content and creative strategies that were no longer enough or truly fit for purpose. And often the content was no longer relevant, making it lose effect and it really didn't even impact the consumers that they wanted to reach. COVID and, and more specifically at the experience of prolonged lockdown periods saw so consumer expectations shift. Um, interesting, um, seeing many kind of uh, hold a much more critical mindset than ever before. So this is a kind of a whopping stat. So 73% of consumers saw, uh, said that their digital experience they received from a brand during lockdown impacted their relationship with brands, even in a very positive way where they kept buying with them, kept uh, having that relationship with that brand, or completely in a negative way where they actually saw their relationship with that brand end and they went to a competitor. And I guess the final piece of the puzzle um, really highlights the crucial consideration and implementation of personalization, which is really what I want to highlight today. There's no doubt that it has become more important than ever before. Uh, and this importance is also reflected through the stats like this one, where 61% of consumers said the lack of personalization from a brand received through COVID impacted their desire to spend with them uh, in the future. So let's deep let's deep dive let's dive deep and unpack the personalization piece a little bit further. Um, the key here is understanding why it is so important, and if you want to be successful in the COVID world, when polled, audiences uh, concurred that personalization made them feel like in, uh, individuals. Something that continues to be important to, to consumers throughout the market, even when COVID isn't uh, relevant. Over 63% of uh, respondents went to say that they've come to expect considered personalization from both brands and retailers alike. And ignoring this need for personalization not only impacts the entire customer or consumer journey, particularly at that point or end of purchase. Consumers agree that they're, they're actually 50% 50 more, 50 more likely to make a purchase because of personalized content or even increase their purchase behavior from personalized content. And so what we've kind of seen at Hogarth um, really supports these in-market stats. 
there is a continued shift in the greater leading to personalization. And this ultimately is what's driving the results for brands that we work with during COVID and what we've seen. No matter kind of the objective, personalization really is key in this, in this case. And I'll take you through what it actually means beyond actually personalizing content, uh, this same technology that can be used uh, across normal content creation. Um, and <clears throat> what we're seeing is not only talks about acquisition, it also is more top of the funnel as well. So branding and awareness and consideration and really being able to speed that, uh, that time to actually close a conversion. Personalization, however, isn't just about making consumers feel uh, like they're communicating directly with a brand and making them feel like individuals or allowing brands to create uh, tailored messaging, which is ultimately what personalization is known for. Over the, six month, over the past six months, what we've seen in the team that I work, I work at in, within Hogarth, we've seen this approach to personalization um, differ, right? So it's actually been, it's, it's the most simple term is around DCO or dynamic creative optimization. Uh, and the reason why brands are tapping into that, it's allowed them to really be reactive at all times across all markets uh, through this templatized approach. So you might not have data to back up how do you talk to a certain consumer at a certain point in their life cycle or their consumer journey. It's about using that same approach that we've used to generate personalized content, but also to templatize it. Um, which we call in the, the creative space uh, a system design network or, or another uh, kind of um, another uh, word is a modular content approach. And so what this allows brands to do, and what we've really seen, I've got a really nice case study to take you through, is that this actually helps brands cover that, uh, that content gap that we've seen in market. So... Now, this all sounds pretty great, right? Um, but in order for this to work seamlessly and successfully, marketers really need to jump into this new approach to content creation. Um, let's put, uh, I guess we need to really stop thinking about this traditional linear approach to producing content, where we only focus on one asset that sits on one platform and one channel. This new approach to content creation, which is around templatization, um, ultimately allows brands to be able to build content in a modular way. So. The, the modular way allows brands to really look at how do we adapt content in real time and be much more effective in a really uh, agile way. Um, a great example of this is we had some brands that built uh, content in a very traditional approach. When COVID happened, they weren't able to be reactive in market at all to, to the messages. Uh, and they were, actually had that content gap, as I mentioned before. So to really kind of highlight the three kind of, sorry, the four components or the four pillars that are critical to this new approach, um, it, it ties into data content strategy, which is all brought together uh, by technology. So I could talk an hour for all of these kind of four core pillars. And unfortunately, we don't have the time today to actually do so. Um, but feel free to, to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'd be more than happy to kind of show you how these four pillars actually come to life and how they actually work toward brands uh, being able to templatize their content beyond just personalizing it, but also using that kind of same methodology on a modular content approach. Um, so to really kind of hit this home and to actually show you guys a case study, um, we, we have, a, uh, have a TikTok case study that we produced um, over COVID uh, for uh, all completely remotely from the other side of the world. Um, believe it or not, over Zoom like we are today, uh, it was produced in one week, which really shows and is testament to this new way of creating content beyond this really rigid, traditional way where the, it's a waterfall approach, where everything has to happen one after the other. We're really talking about how do we look at content creation as being a modular system across all different platforms and, uh, and uh, channels. We've got to do TikTok. Check this out. <laughs> Three, two, one. Right, quick challenge. How many donuts can you stack on your head? Oh, I'm saying seven or eight. Mm, that's jam. That's jam. Incredible. Watch my hair, watch my hair. I can smell vanilla custard. Six. Ooh, seven. seven. I can smell raspberries. Eight. Nine. Stop it. Ten. Hold on. What flavour? Mm, you're waiting. What? Are you kidding me? 
I'm not gonna lie, I never thought that I would ever shoot a TV ad in my living room. The shoot was really fun. Never done anything like that from home, like a full blown shoot with everybody there doing their part. I was a bit nervous about it because you're like, how is this gonna work? We balanced my laptop on the cat tower so that I could have everyone see me. Rainbow, then jump, when I should jump, you waving. It was amazing having no one actually there physically in person and I'm just having to do everything that they tell me. Just a note on the loo roll for my OCD, if they're all like evenly spaced. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, yeah, we had to like black out the windows, you had to move everything out of this room. They actually sent these to my house. These are not my plants. And they were like, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. A bit to your left, a bit to your left. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit up, 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 up. And it must have been a bit weird for you because we're all there on mute watching you and you can't hit. It was like Hunger Games, but a DJ. <laughs> Taff, you're muted. Yeah. Mute, Taff. <laughs> but good chat. <laughs> it's such a good way of uh, working, isn't this, isn't it? It does feel quite magic, just going from one place to the next. Some of them involve the animals as well. <laughs> it's time to get mum on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. What? You, what? <laughs> too old. You're not no, too old. Not. There's no age group, honestly. I have fun with the family doing it. It keeps us all together. Lots of film work and lots of fun. Is that me? Oh. Bonkers, isn't it? Who shows up to a Zoom meeting wearing a cape? Well, the next one, should we all wear something? <laughs> I love the way everyone's just got this to <laughs> TikTok videos have been what's getting me through. What you guys are doing is quite innovative, actually. So to be a part of it is pretty exciting. <laughs> People are just having fun and having a good time on the platform. I can go on there and literally laugh my head off. And there you have our frontline leading doctors, nurses, care assistants, and they're dancing to TikTok. You know, TikTok is going to be one of the biggest things ever. I can feel it. There's something really satisfying about getting a really good TikTok and people liking it. It's something that I won't forget and I'm sure we'll look back on and say, remember that time during quarantine where the show had to go on? And Three, two, one, action. <laughs> Let's do a Mexican wave. Well, thank you so much. Okay, can I change back into my belt and braces now? <laughs>everyone can see my screen. So um, good morning everyone, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today just to quickly reintroduce myself. My name is Gemma Lightfoot and I lead the Creative Excellence Division at Ipsos. Today I'm going to take you through just a brief overview of some of our learnings on how you can maximise the effectiveness of your digital um, communications. As we've heard today, we really are in the midst of a digital pivot and Australians are spending more time than ever online. And so whilst of course that op uh, represents a great opportunity for us, we know that that also comes with its own challenges. And across all digital contexts, attention is in short supply, people are bombarded with information, we have increasingly short attention spans. So brands really do have an increasingly short time to really capture attention. So we believe that to gain attention, our first, first focus really needs to be on building an emotional connection. We know across the board, but certainly within digital, that brand campaigns that use emotional priming to connect with people on a personal level are much more likely to drive brand growth than those that use more rational messaging. Um, and this, this study that we have here in this chart you can see on the left here really highlights this. Um, it was an analysis that was run for Yahoo in the US where we analyzed a number of um, digital display ads. And what we can see is that those ads that really generated a high level of emotion had an 81% lift in terms of purchase intent than those that didn't. 
within that, we also looked at, well, what are the elements that actually help to support or drive that emotional engagement? And we can see here these three key tactics that we could utilize. Social conscience um, being number one in terms of really just appealing to people's desire to do the right thing. And I think there's, there's plenty of examples in this current climate of how brands are really working to deliver and, and, and really appeal to con people's conscience in that sense. You know, if we think um, just a couple of examples that I've included here, um, firstly for Jameson in terms of supporting the bartenders that were out of work during the, um, the lockdown and also Kit Kat with the Are You OK campaign. Just two um, different examples of how we can do this. Another um, element that really helps is that emotive imagery. So utilizing imagery such as families and experiences to really drive that engagement. And finally, the use of creative ad formats is really effective there too. From more of a video perspective, I guess we just want to reinforce that um, what we need to do is really stop people in their tracks, capture their attention and be seen as a content creator rather than an advertiser. And Sam touched on this with some of the examples that he used. You know, it's, it's, it's creative that really moves away from category norms and instead focuses on using unique, entertaining and non-conforming creative um, to really drive this attention. This example is from a recent meta-analysis of over 2,000 video ads. And we see here that the ads that performed best in terms of delivering that visibility and cut through fell into what we called archetype A, combining a use of drama, humor, and conversation. So really what we're saying here is it's just all about telling stories. And I guess that's no surprise. We know that humans love stories. And we know that telling stories within our advertising is, is really effective. But it's just reassuring to know that if we can create those engaging stories, we're going to see that positive impact in terms of brand cut through. In the interest of time, I, um, I'm not going to show this ad, but I just thought I'd use this as a recent example of a good ad that really integrates those elements of drama, humor, conversation to create a really engaging piece of content. Um, the budget direct bad dog ad. So if you haven't seen it, I do recommend that you, you go have a look. But we know that we need to think beyond a single ad. In, in the digital world, we just don't have the full 30 seconds always to capture attention and tell our story. We know it doesn't work to just port over a linear TV ad into the digital context. It just doesn't fit with the way that people consume digital media and watch digital media entirely on their own terms, shifting between devices and channels. So we need to accept that we're not going to be able to necessarily deliver that sto full story and brand message in one short piece of creative. And one way that we can potentially deliver it is using video ad sequencing, which is an update on the traditional model. It allows you to serve up a planned sequence of ads that tell a story um, across a purchase journey. So there's various ways that you can do that using a mix of long and short form ads. And we've got some examples here, but I'm just going to focus on one example, which is this, um, the follow up. And um, that's the example that we have here. And essentially what the follow up does is a long form ad that really really um, builds the drama, introduces the story, really gets the engagement, and then that's followed up with a series of short form ads that um, resolve the conflict and incorporate a call to action. And as we see here in this example, that has a real positive impact versus a standard 30 second in terms of driving the brand, those key metrics around brand awareness, ad recall, and purchase intent. So we want our advertising to entertain and tell stories, but also have strong links to our brand, especially when time and attention spans are short. And this is where distinctive assets come in. The intended role of these assets are to act as brand cues without physically mentioning or showing the brand, weaving the brand into an engaging storyline that leaves a real positive memory. There are a number of different visual assets that can be effective and we just have some examples on the left here in terms of, um, and, and as we see, characters and celebrities in particular are very effective. And I guess just, a, just one example of this would be um, ING's use of Isla Fisher over the past few years, which has been a really successful campaign, a really uh, great way to integrate that celebrity character and become a distinctive brand asset for ING. Uber Eats have um, used, I guess, a similar style, um, certainly in terms of using celebrities, but not one particular celebrity over a particular creative style in terms of that face to camera, um, tonight I'll be eating, um, with the most recent creative obviously featuring uh, Sharon and Kim. 
But this does represent a potential watch out, which is of course that if we're using celebrities as, as a distinctive asset, we do run the risk of those celebrities um, representing other brands. As we've seen um, recently in the case of Magda Savonsky and the, um, Victor the ads for the Victorian government. So branded characters are another opportunity that really represent um, an, uh, an interesting way that we can really drive that brand distinctiveness. They don't represent multiple brands as celebrities do, unless of course we want them to, and they can evolve with the creative style and the story that you want to tell with your brand. Some examples here on the left of just very strong brand characters that really exist in their own right in terms of, you know, the meerkat, the M&M, or the, the range of M&M characters that we have, um, and more recently, St. George bringing their dragon into their creative campaigns. We know that visual assets that um, most closely represent the brand and its values are the ones that are most effective in terms of driving that brand attention. But beyond branding, what's really interesting is that sonic brand cues are actually very effective in terms of driving brand attention. But actually what we found when we conducted the analysis was whilst they were um, very impactful, they didn't tend to be utilized across a lot of creative. And that kind of makes sense, I guess. We know that particularly in the digital world, we're very focused on visual creative that's gonna stand out in a thumb scrolling um, sound off world. But it does suggest that there is some potential there for us to utilize those sonic brand cues and therefore move them across from the digital environment into other um, environments as well. So to summarize, focus on building emotional, focus on emotional brand building, be a content creator rather than an advertiser, sequence your story, don't try and tell it all at once, and use the power of you and try and brand without branding. I'll now hand over to Maria. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm Maria. I'm the MD of Elastic Studios. And I thought that I'd actually kick off by talking about what digital, what it means to be digital first in a creative agency. And essentially, if we're to zoom out and look at the world that we're living in, we're living in a digital age. It's our present. It's our future. And that's not just for us as a creative agency. That's for our consumers and actually everyone else listening into um, the webinar today. Now, as an agency, we go where the consumers go and they're living their lives through the digital realm and everything that this channel is offering up on a daily basis. So with this in mind, it's helped us prioritise our approach to digital within, you know, our creative framework. Now, digital is not a new um, conversation for us. We've been digital first since 2006. We identified very early on that this was the future of creative advertising. Um, and here we are 14 years later, um, talking about the power of, of digital. Now, that's not an ethos that just lives within Elastic Studios. It's an ethos shared by our, with, with our clients. I mean, they're demanding to be front and center with their audience. They're wanting to pierce through the fragmentation of the market and absolutely connect with their consumer. And I dare say that is a universal challenge by all brands that are wanting to really harness that power and, and get in front of their consumers. And digital is the landscape that allows us to do that. So by not seeing that now, um, brands are at a disadvantage. Um, we are pushing the boundaries with our, with our clients. We're going beyond just this role of performance um, and using digital as a landscape to build brand and community, and it's working. A client that we have been actively doing that with is AbbVie. They are a pharmaceutical um, business, highly restricted in terms of what they can say in market, but they came to us with the challenge of needing to connect with their audience, create engagement um, and drive awareness around what they're doing. Um, so we took a digital approach and built out a creative strategy around that to deep dive into what is, what's happening within their business and how they're making positive impact on their community. The result was us breaking the rules of, of content. We built out 
long form content in documentary style um, that went over three minutes and delivered you know, upwards of 500,000 views. What this did for the business was it connected them to their audience. It went beyond performance and far deeper than what a traditional channel um, could, could offer them. So I'll share the clip, a, a condensed version of the clip with you now. Right now, there is so much happening. The human body is truly incredible. But as we all know, sometimes things can go wrong. I had my two-year-old daughter on my lap and I was told I had five years to live with an incurable form of leukaemia. This is our enemy, blood cancer. Before cancer, I was an active kid. It takes the best out of the kids, like it takes their childhood away from them. When combined, Blood cancers are among the most diagnosed cancers and the leading cause of non-preventable cancer deaths. But now, it's in our sights. What scientists were able to do was to develop a drug that's essentially telling the leukemia cells to commit suicide. These drugs target very proteins that are feeding the cancer. The future is exciting because if we continue to support this vital medical research, we hope that one day cancer can be a thing of the past. Today, research is transforming blood cancer from a death sentence to a treatable chronic disease. Our enemy has every right to be nervous. Pretty powerful. Um, so it's one thing to think digital first, it's another to really understand um, the channel and how to build success from it. So um, I think we've all heard the theme today that there's no fixed formula to success. Every client is different in their needs, in their life cycles, in their consumers. Therefore, we really need to take that individualized approach to building out what that creative um, approach is, what that behavior is, and, and how we're building success for our clients. And digital certainly allows us to do that. So there isn't a silver bullet, bullet per se, um, but when we truly understand the channel, its capabilities, and we're matching that with our client's needs, you start to look at the channel in a completely different light. Um, and what we have found in our experience is that you either start to break the rules or create new ones to really um, bring out the best in that channel for your client. Um, when we have um, things like dynamic digital available to us, you know, you're able to create this highly personalised unique brand experience for your not only just your consumer but the brand narrative that you bring into life so to not harness the power of that you're truly missing out on that opportunity we look at digital like a traditional channel and with every traditional channel it has its own framework of how to work best with it um, in terms of best practice but when we make a comparison with TV, for example, you know, we've seen for decades, brands have taken a truly considered approach to building out their TVC to not only build out their campaign, but for that TVC to truly thrive in that broadcast environment. And when we make a comparison to digital, we aren't always seeing that brands are taking that same approach. So again, another missed opportunity of connecting with audience, utilising the platform to its greatest ability to deliver a fantastic um, brand experience. Um, but, you know, digital is a landscape of innovation and innovation does inspire change, whether that's incremental or disruptive, Innovation does need to make sense to what you're setting out to achieve with your client and it can't be confused with um, novelty. But with that in mind, we're seeing amazing work come out of Australia, uh, both from an innovative perspective and just general use of the platform. But equally, there is still a lot of missed opportunity. So there's room for growth, um, I'd, I'd say, within this market. Digital is a prominent channel. It just isn't entirely being used as such as, as yet. Um, a client that we've worked with that has truly embraced 
the power of digital um, is Dakin. We started working with them in 2016. We took the lead on their creative strategy and production um, with, with the with the role of helping them build out and increase their position in market to number one. And we did that over two brand campaigns, the Torture Test and um, Pure Comfort. Um, and essentially the significance between these two campaigns was how the client um, utilised digital um, and evolved its role in its channel mix and essentially in the creative strategy. I'm going to share the Pure Comfort campaign with you now because it truly was the cornerstone to how they pushed forward with digital and essentially build out, um, they built out a brand content pyramid that influenced their behaviour across digital. Take my hand Across our diverse country, Dakin gives you pure comfort inside, wherever you call home. To bring you home, it's all I want, it's all I know. Dakin, bringing Australians the best air anywhere for over 50 years. To bring you home. So... That piece of creative was just the tip of the iceberg um, for Dakin because essentially digital did all the hard work for them. They achieved their number one position in market and absolutely have maintained it. So I think that's a testament to a brand that has tested the, the channel and evolved with it and allowed it to actually inform its future channel mix and comms framework. So I've discussed what it means to be digital first, how to best use the channel, but what is the way forward? And simply it's time for all of us just to lean into the power and the opportunity within this platform. You know, no longer can we take the mindset of we, it's always been done this way, therefore it just is. Digital demands us to be more creative. It demands us to be far more strategic and open to change. I mean, we've got real 5G just around the corner. We've got AI increasing capability um, you know, by the day. So we need to be ready for this change and we need to be open to it because it's actually very exhilarating. Uh, but don't get me wrong, this, this doesn't mean that we disregard all other media channels because every channel has a role and a purpose. Um, and it, it always comes back to what we're trying to achieve with the client. However, digital just makes so much sense for us and is so relevant to everything that we do from creative development to building unique brand experiences and really driving true consumer engagement. So if, if brands aren't seeing this now, it, it's time to open up and test it and, and truly lean into um, the opportunity there. And if you're not sure of how to take it on board, you know, engage your holy grail of resource. Um, the best work that we've done is when we've worked with ourselves as a creative agency, the media agency and publisher with a digital first lens, because that's where you truly get some incredible results. Um, so I have to say digital is here to stay. Um, and as an agency, we will continue to prioritize uh, the channel and evolve with it. Um, and not just from a creative capability perspective, but also you know, for our clients and their priorities. Um, a brand um, that we have worked with over the years is Blackmores. We have a very strong collaborative relationship um, and it makes it very um, creative for us because Blackmores has a very clear purpose um, with digital. Um, they understand the channel, what they're doing on it and what they're wanting to extract from it, but also what their consumers are doing within the channel. Um, so I'd love to introduce Kate uh, from Blackmores. Um, she is uh, leading the digital charge um, and, and bringing their strategy to life. So Kate, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Maria. Hi, Hi Kate. Um, so, Kate, I thought I'd just kick off by asking you, what does, um, what does Blackmore's approach to digital look like and how does that influence your creative brief? 
Okay, great. Thanks, Maria. Um, so essentially, at the heart of what we do is to create um, digital experiences and content that has utility. Uh, we're really passionate about making purpose driven content and not just making content for content's sake. So whether that might be a direct message to action or a mo more sort of emotive inspiration to action, we're always looking to give our audience something tangible that they can do to improve their health and wellbeing. Um, so there's so much content out there, particularly in you know health and wellbeing space. Um, so it's been really important for us to grab attention and hold on to it. And the creative process is a really important, important part of that for us. Um, you know, so working with a, a digital led partner in Elastic um, has really enabled us to evolve our creative over the years um, and to find a framework for our content to meet the objective of each piece that we make. Um, it also means that you guys, you know, you know us really well, you know when and how far to push the boundaries with us. Mm -hmm. You understand the ever changing nature of digital channels and the best approach to take um, with creative to, to capture that attention. I think um, bringing all of those expertise to the table really uh, facilitate a fluid creative process. Um, I think a great example of where we've seen that come to life is in the recent COVID content piece that we created together. Um, before I share it, can you just tell us a little bit around the intention behind the content piece and how content with utility played a role within that? Oh, yeah, so I mean, obviously this year's been pretty challenging. Um, so as a brand, it was really important to us that we show up in the right way and that we stay true to what we do. Um, so we really wanted to be there for our core community, but we're also really conscious of the fact that we needed to get our message just right. Um, so at the time that we did this piece, um, we were starting to see a bit of a shift in how people were feeling. Um, insights from social and consumer research had identified um, a sense of positivity and change after the first lockdown and with the easing of restrictions. And so we really wanted to tap into that. Um, the consumer research was telling us that sentiment was improving and that consumers wanted brands to talk more about the road out um, of, of lockdown. Uh, they wanted brands to include more humour in their communications, positivity in their messaging, more uplifting advertising, um, and over half didn't want brands to even mention COVID um, anymore. So, you know, that was something that we found really interesting. We were also seeing on social that there were elements of this new way of life that people were sort of keen to hold on to, that sort of idea of slow living, more remote working, spending more time with the family, a bit more work-life balance. Um, and there was a real renewed focus on people kind of taking care of their health and wellbeing at that time. So as the restrictions were eased and consumers were sort of moving into this post-isolation life, our objective was sort of help them to live this new definition of what wellbeing um, was for them. Um, we saw it as an opportunity to kind of reinforce that we're the right brand to facilitate this. Um, we've got um, lots of online tools, content programs. We have our free online health advice service with qualified naturopaths. So we really felt that we could help to show the way forward um, for this new wellbeing. And what we really wanted to do was prompt a positive action versus some of the heavier emotional messaging that was also in market at the time. So by collaborating with Elastic, um, you guys really helped us to kind of take all this, evolve the brief, shape the creative to capture this sentiment and sort of stay true to our tone of voice, um, which is really important so that we weren't doing something that was totally off brand um, for what we've done in the past. Um, it was also a really great opportunity to engage our community to get involved um, by reaching out to them and asking them to produce their own pieces of UGC to include in the campaign. Um, and this also gave us a really great sense of what was happening um, in their lives and in their homes as we started to move out of um, the first stage of lockdown. And I think from our perspective, from a creative agent's perspective, perspective, I think the outcome was a really considered piece of content that took all of those insights into account in terms of understanding the sentiment at that time to get that balanced message in market that was showing the way forward, um, but also showing that balanced approach of we know it's happening when, you know, that there is a way forward. Um, from a production point of view, it was an interesting time for us. I mean, we never had to compromise on quality, which is, you know, 
amazing despite having to shoot under you know, COVID restrictions. So by stitching together the UGC piece um, and using professionally shot content that we did under, you know, um, COVID um, protocol, um, it was, it's a beautiful piece of content, which I'm very happy to share with everyone now. Can you tell us um, essentially the outcome and the results of what you got from that content piece? Yeah, so we sort of we felt when we pushed this out um, across social, sort of our own channels, um, and also working with some influencers who um, are closely aligned to our brand, um, that we had the tone was right, and it sort of really matched what we were seeing in the community. Um, it really drove um, engagement with our audience, so we sort of like an uplift in engagement across all our social channels. It was received really positively, um, and sort of the sentiment was was really strong with it as well. So we're we're really happy with it, and we think it was a really great successful piece of content yeah it was it was an amazing piece to produce so thank you Kate for sharing um, your insights um, I'm gonna wrap up and hand back to Jen thanks guys um, really appreciate that really insightful uh, if I could get everyone to please jump back on with your video and sound for a quick very quick Q&A um, I think what's been really great about seeing uh, all the different presentations and I guess the key takeout uh, that I took from it is there's definitely different approaches to the framework um, and the assessment when it comes to creative. Uh, I think we've all sort of echoed the there's not one size fits all, um, but it does depend on the client and, and their objectives uh, as well as, you know, what, what their needs are. So um, it's really great to see diversity there. Um, and, you know, we, we love that we all have differing points of view. Um, so that's really fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I guess just to jump into a, some quick questions that have come through, um, I'm just going to throw to Sam for this one. Uh, we have had a question around how do you um, see the balance between making sure that, you know, if you don't have the right creative, and not running any advertising at all is is a bad ad, bad ad. Uh, you know, worse than not doing anything at all. Uh, what do you what do you see? Yeah, uh, good question. I guess it's it, it all comes down to the the lost cost potential. So um, there are very few bad bad ads. If it's an okay ad, um, you've got to weigh up the fact that brands when they go dark quite quickly lose saliency and brand metrics such as kind of key key imagery um, but the sooner you get the right ad I guess delivered and optimized the, the better so most of the time it's better to run an okay ad if it's going to be terrible yeah call that ad thanks Sam. Um, I guess because we are conscious of time um, some of the other questions that have come through we might potentially do a follow-up with those um, at a later date. But just to leave uh, on this one, I wanted to ask each of you in one word, one or two words, um, what you're probably most excited about uh, in the next 12 months, whether that's you know innovation or just what, what you're most excited about uh, in the next yeah 12 months. I'll, I'll kick off with you, Blake. Getting out of COVID, <laughs> to be honest with you, if anything, uh, going back to somewhat of a norm, um, whatever that norm is, to be honest with you, I think it's, we're in a really good place as an industry. Uh, I think if we continue with this innovation that we've already done, um, 
produced in a normal world, I think we're going to have some really great creative for brands. Awesome. Gemma? Yeah, I'd echo the getting out of COVID for sure. Um, but I think as well, you know, one of the one of the, the good things that has come out of COVID has really been the way that at, at Ipsos, we put a lot of focus on um, developing some of our tools in terms of making them more agile, quick, you know, so some of those elements I'm really excited about kind of building and growing with. And also, I guess, building, um, getting that greater level of insight through new tools around neuro testing, behavioral science frameworks, those kinds of things as well. So lots of, lots of new and exciting things coming out that, that we're really excited to get into over the next 12 months. Awesome. What about you, Kate, from a Blackmore's perspective? Well, from personal and Blackmore's? <laughs> Yeah, so for us, it's about um, using our digital platforms to run small scale tests on creative before we sort of launch them into larger scale campaigns. So this is a really exciting area of development for us. We're not kind of always getting it right, but we're like really looking to build our capability in the next 12 months and looking to get some really interesting and some great results. Awesome. And Maria? I'm from, I'm really excited about what 5G is going to bring in terms of uh, a consumer experience across digital. But I'm also really excited to keep building out personalised brand narratives for consumers and, and bringing that to life. Um, yeah, it, across the platform, I think, it's, I think it's one of the most exciting things that it offers. Awesome. And Sam, last but certainly not least. Thank you. Um, I probably mirror what, what, what Gemma said. Um, new innovations, particularly, so artificial intelligence is coming more and more into everything across marketing, but also in research as well. So for example, we are able to see the effectiveness of ads in, in 15 minutes using AI. Like that is a, a game changer for all of us being able to see how quickly we might be able to see, you know, whether your ad's going to work. So that's exciting. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for your time and your presentations. They were really fantastic. Um, and we will have the, the presentations as well as the recording of today up on the site next week. So stay tuned for that one. Thank you. Um, just to give a little bit of an update from an IAB perspective, um, our Measure Up Research Awards uh, that we've been opening up for the last couple of weeks will come to a close tomorrow. So please make sure that you get your award entries in by then. We've, we've got some that, are, that have already been submitted that are fantastic. So um, the link is in the chat to, to check out more information on that. So uh, stay tuned for, for what's to come with Measure Up in the coming weeks. Um, and we do have a break next week, but we will be back the week after um, to speak more on the financial services category. We have some really exciting insights coming through from uh, some of our members and some uh, future gazing, I guess, in regards to the financial area. So you can register for that for uh, the 1st of October. Um, we'll be back for that one. So. But thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's been really lovely to, to have everyone on. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.